All right, watchers, it's Steve Ciccolanti here, uh, watching the end time signs for you. We've got something uh, fun to look at today. President Barack Obama's uh, first visit to Israel will be exactly a week from today, and it will be a few days before Passover of 2013. And is this significant? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sort of made a prediction that the earth is going to open up and, and swallow a man, and the very next day it happened. So uh, I'm going to try to make another uh, prediction today, but uh, in a lighthearted spirit, I don't want uh, people to get overly serious about it because the purpose is for us to look at the scriptures and understand the scriptures, all right? And whatever happens, uh, we keep trusting in Jesus. But uh, let's have a little bit of fun today. Uh, we're going to look at President Obama's visit in light of uh, the Hebrew roots. Again, we always go back to the Hebrew roots uh, to understand end times. All right, the beginning is prophetic of the ending. Patterns are prophetic and history is prophecy because history repeats itself. Now, there's something in the Hebrew roots that everybody should be aware of. Unfortunately, not many people are. So I'm going to have to start from the basic. We won't cover everything today. We're just going to give you a curse review. But this is God's timeline. Huh? This is God's calendar, God's clock, if you will. Um, his first month is the month of Nisan, right there. And it goes Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Ilul. Tishri, the seventh month, which is becomes the first month of the uh, civil calendar. And then it goes on to the twelfth month there. You can see that the names are not January, February, March. Um, they have their own names, okay? This is the Hebrew clock. The Hebrew calendar, 12 months, sometimes 13 months, because it's a lunar calendar. And within that timeline, God has decided to put seven of the most important events in human history and just put them in there as feasts. They're called the Feasts of God. There are seven of them, and any Hebrew child would know these. Uh, unfortunately, many Christians are not educated about it, so we're just going to quickly go through. What are the seven feasts? The first one is Passover. It happens in the first month, followed quickly by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then First Fruits. Wait 50 days. In the third month is the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Shavuot in Hebrew, Pentecost, as we uh, Christians tend to know it by. Then we got to wait a few months, about four months, and then the last three feasts, the fall feasts, come. Uh, Yom Teruah, or the Feast of Trumpets, on the 1st of Tishri. The 10th is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And lastly, the 15th, Sukkot, the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Wedding Feast. All of these are uh, historical and prophetic, all right? They refer to something in history and something in prophecy. Let me give you a basic uh, outline of that. All right, Passover on the 14th of Nisan. In the past, in the past, uh, Moses instructed the Jews to kill the Passover lamb on the 14th of Nisan. And then in the future, uh, in relative to that scripture, uh, Christ came and was crucified exactly on the 14th of Nisan. All right? No coincidence. The rabbis say, Coincidence is not kosher. The next day, the 15th of Nisan, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that commemorates the Exodus. Again, it, every feast refers to something in the past and something in the future. All right, and unleavened bread is basically bread without yeast that then uh, goes into an oven and then it comes out with burnt marks and with perforations in it, right? You've seen basically a cracker, you see it, you've seen unleavened bread. And that's a perfect type of what happened to Jesus because he was that perfect body without sin. And then he was put into the oven of not just a tomb, but an oven, which is uh, he descended to hell for three days to pay for our sins, which deserve to be punished in hell. He took all our punishment. He was there and then he rose again which happened three days later on the 17th of Nisan. Again, in the past, the 
Israelites came to the Red Sea, they thought they were stuck, and then God made the waters rise up into a heap on both sides, and then they crossed over on dry land. And it just so happened that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, 17th of Nisan, right there. So you can see that God had predicted all of these things on his calendar. There's a 50-day wait, and then the fourth feast on the 6th of Sivan, uh, in the past, the Torah was given, and then in the future, the Holy Spirit uh, came down on the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. And right, the church was born that day. So you can see that all of these things were predicted in time because God considers these the most important events. And each one of these are very significant. I mean, we'll never plumb the depths of, of each one of the feasts. I think uh, over and over uh, on, the, on the anniversary of the Feast, significant events happen. But today, we're just going to look at the Feast of Passover because Barack Obama is going to Israel a few days before the Passover, and people are wondering, uh, what's up with that? Is there any significance? Well, there, there may be some significance, and we want to explore that right now. To understand uh, this a period of time, you need to know that Jesus Christ uh, followed God's timetable to the exact letter. And in the book of Exodus, uh, Moses was actually instructed to tell the Israelites to uh, get a lamb. Every household was supposed to get a lamb. And um, make sure you get the lamb on the 10th of Nisan. So that's four days before the lamb would be uh, slaughtered and then the blood would cover the doorpost. The wood of the doorpost represents the cross of Jesus Christ. This is all prophetic of what was going to happen when the Messiah came. So the tenth then became a day that the rabbis um, followed. Uh, it's the day that the lamb is presented for inspection. All right, The day that the lamb is presented for inspection. And of course everything in God's uh, pattern it is historical and prophetic. So on the tenth of Nisan, guess what happened? Jesus Christ presented himself as the perfect lamb, right? He came, he entered into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. There may be more to it than we're thinking. Uh, the 10th of Nisan may be the day that the Antichrist presents himself as the false lamb. See, if he's trying to copy Jesus, he's trying to be uh, a replacement of Jesus, right? a substitute for Jesus, then he's going to do the things that Jesus did. And uh, that's an interesting uh, scenario that may work out that way. The Antichrist may come into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. Now let's go to Barack Obama's schedule because this was released by the White House. And here's his tentative schedule, they said, on March the 20th. All right, March the 20th. That's uh, six days away. President Barack Hussein Obama arrives at Ben Gurion Airport as a ceremony. Uh, he'll inspect the Iron Dome anti-missile battery, which will be brought to the airport. He's meet, meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, going to his house. It'll be a press conference. He'll have dinner at the Prime Minister's house. All right. Next day, March 21st, this is his uh, full day in Israel. He's going to visit the shrine of the book housing the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's interesting. Five and one half hour visit to Ramallah. He's going to meet with the Palestinian Authority President, Mahmoud Abbas. He's going to make a speech to students at the International Convention Center in Jerusalem, which is very interesting because a lot of people are kind of offended by this that he chose not to go to the uh, Knesset or the equivalent of the Jews' parliament. It's going to be a reception with the new U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, at the American Consulate in Jerusalem. Interesting, John Kerry's back up. And there'll be a state dinner hosted by President Shimon Peres. All right, so the president is Shimon Peres, but the prime minister is Benjamin Netanyahu. They have two heads of states. March 22nd, his last day, there's going to be a wreath-laying ceremony. Again, this is all tentative, but this is what they say at the graves of Theodore uh, Herzl, and also Yitzhak Rabin, which uh, was a prime minister who was assassinated. 
He's going to be meeting with the head of the opposition. And here's a very interesting one. He's going to visit the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And um, I'm going to take a look at that. And he gets on his plane at 2 p.m. according to this schedule. I want to show you on the calendar where we're at. Okay, Today, as I'm recording this, this is the 14th of March. All right, It might take me a couple of days to upload this, but at least you know it was recorded on the 14th of March 2013. And what's interesting also is, you know, yesterday, it seems to be a very prophetically significant time, yesterday, you know what happened, on the 13th of March, the conclave elected a new pope. So we've now got an Argentinian uh, pope named uh, Francis. By the way, Argentina means uh, silver, and silver's a uh, symbol of redemption. But let's get back to the calendar. Today is the 14th, and we're looking at Obama's visit from the 20th to 22nd, so uh, less than a week away, in fact. And a significant date that we want to look at is this 10th of Nisan, or the 21st of March. And you can see there that Passover is just four days away from that 10th of Nisan date. So 10th of Nisan, 11, 12, 13, 14, that's the day that Jesus our Lord was crucified for the sins of the world. And what's interesting is the president decided to put a Friday in his visit, and you know that Friday is the uh, worship day of those who follow the religion of Islam. It happens to be the sixth day. So you notice that um, Muslims worship on the sixth day. So six is their number. Jews worship on the seventh day. That's their number. And then Christians worship on the first day of the week, which can be called the eighth day for new beginnings, or the first day uh, either way. All right. So one of the intriguing questions that people are asking is, is Obama Muslim? And uh, I heard it from a top military official in the U.S. who meets with Obama. And according to him, he has absolutely no doubt that Obama is a Muslim. The fact is, I don't have private meetings with him, so I don't know for sure. But... I just ask us to try to think of it in reverse. Do you know a Christian whose parents name him Hussein? In fact, it almost seems that if your name is Hussein or your middle name is Hussein, um, you are a Muslim. Do you know a Christian whose father and stepfather are Muslim? You know, his mother married a Muslim from Kenya and then remarried a Muslim from Indonesia. So if your father is a Muslim, and Islam is a patriarchal religion, remember that. It's not matriarchal like the Jews. You know, they trace their um, religious heritage through their, their mothers. But Islam, uh, they trace their heritage or their religion through their fathers. Interesting, both his fathers are from Muslim countries, follow the Muslim faith. Do you know a Christian whose parents send him to a Muslim school in Indonesia? I certainly don't know any Christian parents who send their kids to a Muslim school. Do you know a Christian president who has bowed in submission to a Saudi king? You can see no US president has ever bowed to a Saudi king and President Obama is uh, fully uh, in a position of submission in this picture. You can see it's uh, significant in other cultures that his head is below the head of the Saudi prince. Right, so he's a tall man. He had to go fairly a uh, long way down to uh, achieve that bow. Obama, interestingly, has never bowed to the Queen of England. We have great relations with with uh, the United Kingdom. Miss Manners said Americans do not bow to foreign monarchs because that act uh, would signify the monarch's power over his subjects. You can see also Obama's um, attitude towards Islam. He's always very pro uh, 
uh, Islam, the U.S. ambassador, his U.S. ambassador, Chris Stevens, was assassinated on the anniversary of September 11, uh, 2012, in Benghazi, Libya. To this day, it's not clear what happened, why he wasn't protected, and Obama right away blamed it on an anti-Muslim cartoon, and later they had to renege because it was obvious that wasn't true. So, let's look at some unusual coincidences about these, uh, uh, this visit. Obama's first visit to Israel falls on the same day that Jesus Christ presented himself in Jerusalem as the Lamb of God. That's the tenth of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar. Remember, God works on his calendar, not on the Gregorian calendar. And the tenth of Nisan doesn't always fall on the same day on our calendar. So let's take a look at a Hebrew calendar. <clears throat> Right, again, you've got his arrival on the 20th, stays on the 21st to the 22nd. And what's interesting is on the Hebrew calendar, Obama's going to be in Israel and in Jerusalem the exact same day that Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem and presented himself as a lamb for inspection. So what does that mean? In 2013, Nisan the 10th happens to be one day after winter, in other words, the first day of spring, and also before a Sabbath. Now, why is that significant? Because it fits Jesus' words, but pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, Matthew 24, verse 20. All right, so other days may fit, but the point of uh, this is we're watching for signs that fit the, the scriptures. And this fits, all right, this fits. Take a look at this. On the 20th, winter ends, spring begins, all right? Then he'll be there this full day, and then he'll leave on that day. Obama is scheduled to go to the Church of the Nativity, which is the symbolic birthplace of the Lord Jesus Christ, on Nisan the 11th, or Friday, March 22nd. This again is the sixth day of the holy day of Islam. And what's very unusual is this happens to be exactly 1,260 days, in other words, three and a half years, since Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize. And you can look that up. Uh, you can use a Google calculator and go from uh, the 9th of October 2009 at 1,260 days. And you're going to arrive at Friday, March the 22nd. You can do it the other way. Start at March 22, 2013, minus 1,260 days. A Google Calendar will do it. And you're going to arrive at the day that Obama was hailed as a Prince of Peace and given this Nobel Peace Prize, which many of us wonder, what did he do to deserve it? Um, if you watch the acceptance speech, he says, with great humility. It is with great humility that I accept this. All right, so we're going to put it there on the calendar. Again, we're on the 14th today as of the recording. And we're one week away from the day that Jesus presented himself as the Lamb of God in Jerusalem. And Obama will be there in Jerusalem for the first time, for the first time ever. He's going to be there, and he picked this day. And then, 1,260 days, or three and a half years, very prophetic time, uh, for all prophecy buffs, you know, we're, we're watching that three and a half year period. Well, exactly three and a half years since he was crowned a Prince of Peace, uh, he's going to enter the Church of the Nativity or the birthplace of Jesus Christ. So we'll all be watching what's going to happen uh, during those three days. Now, I want to add one more thing on this calendar. He's not going to be there, but the Bible already says that, you know, whoever um, fits the... Uh, fits the, and I hesitate, you know, I really hesitate to call Obama the Antichrist. I really, uh, I loathe to do that because he's an American and I'm really watching for the Middle East, but I'm just watching this pattern. This is one of the many patterns. Whoever is the Antichrist and desecrates a holy place uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, uh, he's going to do it after winter because Jesus said to the Jews, pray it doesn't happen in winter. So here's one day, two days after winter. 
and pray don't be on the Sabbath here's the Saturday then there's the Sabbath of Passover and then you go on to unleavened bread which goes on for seven days and you've got first fruits on the third day so it's going to be a Sabbath all the way through after he leaves so he's coming in at the perfect window um, if he fits the bill and I'm not saying yet that he does but if he does I want to add one more thing to uh, to this calendar for us to watch all right we're just watching we're not we're not going to be dogmatic about it but we're watching this after he leaves the feast of Passover occurs on the 25th of March here it is 14th of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar and Jesus uh, was crucified on that day and year after year they sacrificed the lamb on that day right as 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 a symbol of the payment that Jesus blood uh, paid for the sins of the world so if Barack Obama is to fit the bill which um, he hasn't disputed this Newsweek cover I mean if if anybody believes in Jesus Christ and was called the second coming um, I think any true Christian would would have to tell them to not do that but he didn't do that um, he seems proud of, of uh, how the media celebrates him and if he is to fit this symbol of being the second coming or the false messiah the false type of Christ then there's one more thing that should happen which is an assassination attempt in Israel uh, this may be a real possibility why do I say this? I'm not dogmatic, I'm not predicting, I'm just saying according to the pattern on the calendar it would be fitting because it would fit the typology, it would be a powerful symbol that he presented himself as a lamb and then he was nearly sacrificed. He won't die from it and it would be a it would fit the prophetic pattern of the dates. Also we have a scripture in Revelation 13 verse 3 and I saw one of his heads as it were again Revelation 13 is about the Antichrist okay I'm not saying Obama is the Antichrist but if this happens to him in the next few days well then we're basically um, looking at Revelation 13 being fulfilled and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death it was very interesting as it were wounded to death I don't know why John didn't say I saw one of his heads wounded to death uh, as it were wounded to death almost seems like it was staged like it was orchestrated uh, be that as it may I'm not sure why those extra words are there I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed so he wasn't killed from it and and all the world wondered after the beast so imagine if Barack Obama uh, is uh, shot something happens where it looks like he died but he comes back he in a way resurrects can you imagine the impact it would have on the world where well, he's in Israel supposedly promoting peace and he now suffers the violence and people will just wonder after him and I think it would give him a lot of power to be able to say, well, I want this done in Israel. Or I want this done in the Middle East. I'm just saying that's a possibility. A different possibility is the successful as assassination of Benjamin Netanyahu. And it could happen any time, but it'd be highly symbolic if it happened on this visit. Why is that? Well, there is a uh, Torah code that was discovered many years ago that talks about it. Let me just give you a background of this. Uh, journalist Michael Drosnin published the Bible Code in 1997 based on the work of Jewish rabbis like Eliyahu Rips. And uh, I was a, a Christian at that time. I just accepted Jesus Christ a few years earlier. And I got that book, The Bible Code, and, and I read it in 1997. And Drosnin reported a show-stopping claim that the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in November 1995 was foretold by the Torah codes of the Bible codes along with the city Tel Aviv and the name of the assassin Amir. The interesting thing is Drossen's not a believer, he's not Jewish, he's not Christian. 
And from that, the Bible codes attracted worldwide attention. Now, I don't necessarily recommend Drosten's book now because we have just uh, gone light years ahead in terms of revelation and knowledge about the Torah codes and about the end time codes. Uh, we're much farther along than, than what he knew now. But the interesting thing is in 19, 1997, Drossen reported a code which predicted the assassination of then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was Prime Minister from 1996 to 1999 and then he quote unquote retired. So I was watching this since, since that time. I have been watching it. And when he retired, either the code was wrong or Benjamin Netanyahu had to reappear on the political uh, world stage. And he certainly did. He was re-elected Prime Minister in 2009. And he remains Prime Minister to the present time, as of this recording. And interestingly, he became Prime Minister in 2009, which was the same time that Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize. So we're possibly looking at here the breaking of the first seal, or the white horse, the great deceiver, um, the false prophet, running, galloping. Uh, it may already have happened since, since the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded. So we're looking at the possibility that Benjamin Netanyahu uh, is the end-time Prime Minister of Israel. He may be the one that will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Obama, and he's going to meet with Obama uh, next week. All right, let me give you the scripture. Revelation 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In other words, God intends for us to watch for the signs of his coming. God says those who will not watch will not know the time. Implying those of us who watch should know his approach. What should we do? First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Peter said, here's the instruction. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. I like that. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So four instructions. Pray. Make sure you pray more as Jesus is approaching. Love more. Forgive people. Don't hold any grudges or offenses. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Be hospitable. All right? Open up your heart. Open up your home. Entertain people. Welcome people. Don't shut the door of your heart to people. And uh, serve the church. Serve your church with your gift. Whatever gift you have, serve. You know, I'm making these YouTube videos because I believe God's given me some insights, some revelation. And I just want to bless the body of Christ and anyone that happens to find us on YouTube. You know? Just sharing my gift. So we've covered uh, just the first feast of the seven feasts of Israel, the Feast of Passover. In fact, there's more that we can do. We've covered these four. We haven't even covered the last three, which are prophetic of the second coming of Jesus Christ. There's so much more that, that uh, God has hidden in just seven feasts. There's really not that many. You know, seven most important events according to God's perspective. If you wish to learn more about the Hebrew roots of end-time prophecy, we have recorded four hours worth of solid teaching that you can get on DVD from this website right here at the bottom of your screen, discover.org.au. All right, just check that out. There's lots of other resources. And um, we make it to bless you. If you want to study more, uh, avail yourself of that. It supports the ministry, helps us to do these free things as well. If you like our graphics and things that we put up, we do that on a real limited budget. We try to squeeze you know, uh, as much as we can out of limited resources. And uh, I hope you enjoy that. All right, guys, the Bible says to test everything, prove all things. So we're going to know pretty soon if uh, Obama fits the bill and fits the timeline. All right, meanwhile, I'll be watching the signs for you. God bless you.